Rabbi, Rabbi Schneier, Your Eminence Cardinal Parolin, Your Eminence Archbishop Elpidophoros, Dr. Kissinger, Mr. Schwartzman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Well, before I start, I should say that I'm really moved. I'm moved by all this, uh, all this being said tonight, this fantastic evening, your warmth, your applause. The words of Rabbi Schneier, the words Steve Schwartzman, uh, but I should say especially the words of Dr. Kissinger. Um, I, I should say I'm, I'm really moved by the fact that you took the time to come here on this occasion and say what you said. But just the very fact that you are here tonight is a gift, an enormous present to me. Thank you. Yes, our, 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 our friendship started, uh, it was exactly 30 years ago, on that plane. <laughs> and, um, and then somehow grew throughout the years, even though we've been seeing each other at, uh, quite sparsely. Um, but on, of recent, with the events that uh, have been happening over the last 12 months, we had the opportunity to uh, have uh, especially one deep conversation about what was happening. And that was just after a month of war, I would say. And uh, what to do now, and what to do next, and how should we, um, should we approach these autocracies? And I'll say something about that tonight, too. I'm deeply grateful to receive this award, and uh, I would like to thank again Rabbi Schneier and the Appeal of Conscience Foundation and all of you for this honor. You have awarded this prize to many great stateswomen and statesmen before me, and it's truly humbling to be in their company. I would like to pay tribute to the late Shinzo Abe, who stood on this stage last year. Abe was a strong believer in Japan's duty to contribute to global stability. He acted forcefully to reinvigorate the Japanese economy through a combination of policies which they were called Abe economics, Abe comics or something was monetary policy, supply-side reforms, fiscal policies. His life was, as we know, tragically cut short, but his legacy lives on among the people of Japan and beyond. The importance of dialogue, which we celebrate tonight, has been squarely at the center of my professional life as an economist and as a policymaker. The value of a successful partnership between multilateral bodies and local institutions was one of the main lessons I learned while working at the World Bank in the 80s. Rewriting the rules of global finance, as we did on the Financial Stability Board in the wake of the 2008 crisis, required mutual trust, open-mindedness, and the ability to compromise. The European project, which uh, has granted peace and stability in Europe after centuries of conflicts, hinges on the strength of shared institutions such as the European Central Bank. The G20, which Italy presided over last year, confirmed that only global cooperation can help, can help to solve global problems from the pandemic to climate change. The potential for mutual understanding to be a force for good is larger the more integrated is our world. 
to be successful for everyone, and especially the most vulnerable, globalization demands a joint set of rules. And yet, today, we face a significant challenge to the idea that we can work together for the benefit of all countries. Russia's invasion of Ukraine risks ushering in a new age of polarization, one we have not seen since the end of the Cold War. The question on how we deal with autocracies will define our ability to shape our common future for many years to come. The solution lies in a combination of frankness, coherence, and engagement. We must be clear and vocal about the founding values of our societies. I'm referring to our belief in democracy and the rule of law, our respect for human rights, our commitment to global solidarity. These ideals should guide our foreign policy in a clear and predictable, and I underline predictable, manner. When we draw a red line, we must enforce it. When we make a pledge, we must honor it. Autocracies thrive on exploiting our hesitancy. We should avoid ambiguity, not to regret it later. Finally, we must be willing to cooperate, so long as it doesn't mean compromising on our core principles. This week marks the 77th United Nations General Assembly. I hope there will be a future when Russia decides to return to the very norms it subscribed in 1945. For all the gloominess of the times we live in, I remain, well, cautiously or not, optimistic about the future. The heroism of Ukraine, of President Zelensky, and of his people is a powerful reminder of what we stand for or what we stand to lose. The European Union and the G7, together with our allies, have remained firm and united in support of Ukraine in spite of Moscow's attempts to divide us. Our collective quest for peace continues, as shown by the deal to unblock millions of tons of cereals from the ports of the Black Sea. Only Ukraine can decide which peace is acceptable but we must do all we can to favor an agreement when it finally becomes possible. In a divided world, the role of religious leaders and of the institutions you lead is essential. For all your differences, you champion peace, solidarity, human dignity, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your faith can guide us and help us heal. You can reach across borders, speak to our collective conscience and to the soul of individuals. You can show the way forward through dialogue, build new bridges when old ones have collapsed, and you can hold us to account. As I was reminded during my recent visit to Yad Vashem, Indifference is the worst foe of humanity. Speaking out is not only a moral obligation, it's a civic duty. To those who demand silence, submission, and obedience, we must oppose the power of words, and if need be, of deeds. Today, the world needs courage, clarity, but also hope and love. Thank you.